You know, it's one of those in our building. They're not using it. I think it's been sort of converted into office space of sorts, but the problem is, is that the county's broke, so the idea podcast, I thought I was going to cry. It went well. It was great. It was yeah. There's an article coming out next month, a clinical commentary about all the weaknesses of the, or the potential statistical weaknesses of the four massive lava safety trials that the FDA mandated. And in the end, I'm probably not going to answer any of the questions. <laughs> Podcast. Well, anyway, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the, pod, I'm the podcast editor, so you should listen to our podcast. Statistics about my injury, and I'm not optimistic that I will be healing with physical therapy. I suspect I'll be getting surgery at the end of August because I have to get through grass season. If I left now, my two hard working partners would. Uh, that's 
why I get three months to recover before. Gotta keep your priorities correct. And they're huge. They're huge. Yep. I remember when they first came out with this night study of Alpha One. I had a guy in my office and I'm bound to be He came back three months later with new lungs. Put him at the top of the transplant list. The guy couldn't even just walk and he was playing baseball with his kids. He was so excited. We used to bump them to the top of the transplant list. I'm sure we still do it now. I know because I like to have like 
That's the goal of this. So that's the goal of all your hats. Well, it's just one But it depends on the case. So when you do a staging media style, if you have a cut of triple chocolate, it's just it actually is. I can bring back for Yeah, that was one of those cakes where I feed everybody in this I brought the nice weather from Chicago, so you trying to say? Nice enough. Though it snowed a couple days ago. We've had flooding from all the rain, but other than that, I'll bring you. Locust All right, let's go ahead and uh, and get started. I just have uh, one announcement because I just want to make sure I didn't confuse people about the last session of the year because, you know, I sent out multiple emails trying to decide when to do it. So ultimately, more people voted to do it not two sessions in the same day. So the last session in this room, which will be an actual CME presentation, is May 21st. And then the next evening, the Wednesday evening, we'll have a, the dinner social function uh, there is a scientific presentation briefly that I'll give, but uh, I want to encourage as many people to come as possible because it's really a year-end celebration of our division, our business, our broader allergy community. We've got uh, one of our fellows graduating, so we want to be there for that. And then the other two fellows are generally asked to give presentations praising the faculty. <laughs> Or preset or, slide, or, right? <laughs> so that is more or less the agenda for that evening. So again, that's uh, Wednesday, the 22nd, at about 6:30 in the evening. Today, I'm very happy to to uh, introduce Kyle Hogarth. I heard him give a presentation about a year ago. Uh, the main reason I invited him is with my hearing loss. He speaks loudly enough that I can hear <laughs> the whole presentation. But anyway, it's going to be a very valuable presentation on alpha-1 antitrypsin. And then for any of you who can stay, we've got a, pres a professor's rounds, the case that we're going to present to him to follow. So thanks for coming to town. Thanks for having me. All right. <laughs> well, um, I appreciate this opportunity. Um, I, uh, as a way of a background, I'm a pulmonary critical care uh, doc, internal medicine trained prior. I really don't do much medicine anymore, and I... I do some critical care, but my primary work is in the world of pulmonary. Uh, I'm the director of interventional bronchoscopy, so I spend a lot of time doing bronchoscopy. And when I'm not doing that, I'm running a clinic uh, devoted to a disease that I was told was rare. You were told it was rare. I was taught that it was rare. Um, I was told that I'd have two patients in my career, and by the time I found a third alpha-1 patient, it was the marker of that I needed to retire because uh, I'd clearly been around too long. Um, I had three patients within six months, should have retired, um, and uh, went from there. So we're, we're a large center. I run a resource center at the University of Chicago. Um, I have 128 patients under my direct care, and then to indirectly consult on another 100 plus uh, that come to see me sporadically. Um, and the subtitle of this talk, you know, the more common than you think, what I'm going to try to spend time doing is, is really kind of going to be two talks in one. Um, the first one's going to be all about the disease and trying to break down the myths that we were all taught, that I was taught, that, you know, how rare it is, you'll never see it, yada, yada. And I'm going to show you what the disease actually is and, and, and try to point out and prove to you that you've already seen it, but if you didn't test for it, you missed it. Uh, it's because it presents so much like everything else we see on a daily basis. And then the second test, or second part of the talk, if you will, will be about um, the FDA-approved therapeutics for it, um, and we'll go from there. Um, so, let me first start with my conflict of interest. I run a large Alpha-1 center, and my view of it is um, I'll work with anybody that wants to let me talk about Alpha-1. So there's three companies that manufacture products. I work with all of them. I also work with the Alpha-1 Foundation. I've had research grants. I'm also on the American Thoracic Society Committee writing the next set of guidelines. You know, most of this talk is based on the 2003 guidelines and standards document that the ATS and the ERS put out. We're updating it. It should be out hopefully by the end of the summer. But, you know... Guidelines are like sausage. You don't really want to see how it's made. You just like the end outcome. And so um, hopefully we'll, we'll get it by the end. So my goal today, what I want to try to get across, is we're going to recognize all the different ways that it presents clinically. Again, what we were taught represents just the tip of the iceberg. 
We're going to go through the American Thoracic Society guidelines because there's at least a standard, if you will, um, on what, you know, who should be tested, uh, evidence-based, obviously. Then we'll go through, because I hope of that, because, you know, as we jump to that, you will increase your testing, that you'll see that there's a value to figuring out if your patient has this or if they're a carrier, etc. And then we'll examine the data that supports the idea of uh, the intravenous infusions to replace the levels. Um, it's banner year, actually, in Alpha-1. It's the 50th anniversary of the discovery of Alpha-1. Um, and so, um, big milestone year, if you will. So I'm going to start with cases, not because there's obviously any science here, but, but they're, they, they are anecdotes. They're from our clinic. But they do highlight several principles that I'm going to want to get across in later slides, so just bear with me. The first one I always say is the sort of classic description. This is what we were all taught in medical school, if you were, if you were taught anything about the disease. 42-year-old comes in, former smoker, 15 years, but quit five years ago, always having trouble breathing, always winded, you know, just keeps getting worse and worse. Is doctor shopping. We're the third clinic she's arrived to. She came to our general pulmonary practice. You name an inhaler, she's been on it. You name a blood test, she's had it, except for the one blood test. Um, we must have been the only people who examined her because she's hypoxemic. Her lung function is atrocious. She's got the classic exam of an advanced emphysema patient, and sure enough, she's an alpha-1 patient. But the problem with this, this and this is the, the classic description, the first three patients out of the, or the three clinical patients out of the five that were described in the landmark paper were all young, barely smokers or never smokers. But let me ask you, I mean, really, did, did you need all the collective training that this room represents to know that a 40-year-old barely smoker shouldn't have end-stage emphysema, right? I mean, you know, you might, even when you were a kid, you didn't know what to call it. It didn't have a name, but, you know, it didn't pass what I like to call a smell test, right? You know, something's fishy here, right? So... This is the easy one, as far as I'm concerned, and this is what traditionally gets tested. You know, this shows up in your clinic, this one gets an alpha-1 test. But do these get an alpha-1 test? Here you got a bronchiectatic. person keeps coughing up sputum, the CT scan actually shows diffuse bronchiectasis, pseudomonas is growing out. He actually gets a workup for cystic fibrosis first by the, by the uh, pulmonologist. Sees an allergist as well to determine whether or not there's immune deficiencies going on. All of that's negative. Ultimately, in the end, after the workup of bronchiectasis, what is, does come back positive is the fact that he's an alpha-1 deficient patient. And there's actually some strong evidence that, though not clear mechanistically, but strong evidence of an association between alpha-1 antitrypsin and bronchiectasis. And obviously, with CT resolution getting better and better, the incidence of this is actually going up, meaning you know, we don't think it's there's some you know, epidemic of it. It's just that we're recognizing when there's imaging occurring on our alpha-1 patients who we've traditionally been following as just a pure emphysema patient, there's actually significant bronchiectasis. You know, bronchiectasis obviously has a broad workup, but alpha-1 definitely needs to be involved in that discussion. Then this gentleman, this came for our severe asthma clinic, and it's truncated, but I'll, uh, I'll highlight it for you. He's a 47-year-old former smoker years ago, and it was 10 pack years total, but 30 years of a well-documented moderate persistent asthma, also some sleep apnea. He's on an high-dose inhaled steroid, a lava, and leukotriene modifiers. His IgE is um, 42. He has, uh, is under the care of, of an allergist getting immunotherapy, uh, trying to help from a symptomatology perspective. Despite that, he continues to have ongoing exacerbations and decline. We have everybody arrived at our clinic off meds. I want to see how bad you are, right? He arrives with a 45% of predicted FEV1. Post albuterol, he pops all the way up to 70. It's one of the most robust albuterol responses that I've ever seen. And the key point, though, from the guidelines that exist for alpha-1 is that though it, there's no debate about this gentleman's asthma, I think clinically, what is definitive is he doesn't reverse to normal. And sure, this is what bad asthma does, right? We all see this fixed airflow obstruction. You bet. But it's also what happens when there's alpha-1 going on and there's been ongoing lung function loss. And equally important, prior pulmonary function testing, this gentleman was 75% post-albuterol last year. Two years prior to that, he had sporadic testing. His FEV1 post-albuterol was 82% predicted. There's been a steady decline, which had just been attributed to badly controlled asthma. The argument here is it's not just badly controlled asthma, it's actually alpha-1. I will point out just clinically, since being started on augmentation therapy for his progressive loss of lung function, he hasn't exacerbated since. He's still on his high-dose steroids. He's still getting immune modulation. He's still 
you know, on those lavas, etc. But he's become an um, extremely happy patient. Two more. The old rule of Alpha 1 was you couldn't be a certain age because you died. You know, if you had a, someone who was 61, they can't have Alpha 1 because they should have been dead already. And they can't have smoked 30 pack years because they should have died twice already. And they live, she lives with a smoker. And she lives in Gary, Indiana, which means she comes to Chicago for the clean air. And so she's not exactly thriving, though. Her lung function is atrocious, obviously. But her, and her FEV1 of 32%. But the guidelines are pretty clear about who should be tested. Anyone with airflow obstruction. So we tested her. Sure enough, she's an alpha-1 patient. The part that's distressing is that even when it's the most obvious history. So this lady had a sister die of emphysema at the age of 32, and no one had ever tested her for alpha-1. She has a brother who's been getting augmentation therapy for his alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, and no one tested her. And so I always use her as an example because I'll frequently hear people say, well, I know what a patient looks like. Well, this does not fit the classic description, but this sure does. And so even when we have the most obvious example in front of us, we miss it. And then lastly, good old generic COPD. You know, I have residents who say, I think I want to be a pulmonologist. I saw that really cool bronc thing you did. It was amazing. I saw this great rare case, yada, yada. And I said, no, no, no. You better just like COPD because that's what's going to put food on your table, right? For all the zebras out there, you're going to see a thousand good old boring generic COPD. But the thing is, generic COPD, 20 pack years of smoking, 65% FEV1, got a thousand of these. It's actually genetic COPD. Not that infrequent, actually. And they look the same. So, alpha-1 is an interesting disease. Uh, this is the molecule, if you're into those kind of things. It's actually an accidental discovery. Because in 62, Bertel Laurels uh, and Sten Erickson, his resident, were running gels. They published in 63. Um, and the patients with advanced emphysema were actually seeing Sten. Uh, this was uh, the first true bench-to-bedside. They actually had no... Um, true realization of what they had discovered as judged by the fact that they published in the Scandinavian Journal of Clinical Lab Investigation, an impact factor of minus five. And so, um, you know, if they kind of knew what they'd stumbled upon, I think they would have republished it in a better journal, if you will. Around the same time, the association with liver disease uh, was discovered and that alpha-1 was made in the liver and had an associated liver disease with it. And that 10% of ZZ patients developed neonatal cholestasis and can progress on to cirrhosis. This is actually not an uncommon reason that children get a liver transplant. But more distressing, because the old thought was that adults didn't ever develop liver disease, but they actually do. Um, if, in other words, the thought was if you made it through childhood, you were fine. As they're living older, we're seeing more and more liver disease developing in adult life. And this has been a shift because you know, I work in the intensive care unit. I get patients who come in with unexplained cirrhotic effects and or an acute hepatic failure. And, you know, everyone works them up for viral stuff. And when it's negative, you know, everyone just kind of shrugs. This has become part of the workup, again, if you will, for adult liver disease. Um, and it turns out, this has actually opened up Alpha-1 once again, sort of blazing the trail. Because prior to Alpha-1, we really didn't have a, a great explanation for progression of lung disease or lung destru destruction. It also was the pioneer for these protein-folding diseases, that misfolding of proteins leading to problems because it is a misfolding of, of the Z mutation of the alpha-1 gene that leads to an accumulation and the blockage of the release of the protein from the liver. And then it's basically uh, due to an uh, injury reaction. So when you biopsy the liver, it's chuck full of alpha-1 protein, just all congealed. So if you're new to alpha-1 or if you've if You've had some knowledge of it. This is how we've always thought of the disease. And it works. It's real simple. Um, it's probably a model for just about any. I mean, I, IgG and others, right? That you have plenty of protection against whatever amount of burden. And the elastase, it's a neutrophil elastase. So it's a white blood cell mediated destructive enzyme. And as its name implies, destroys elastin rapidly. Um, I'll show you later in animal models. But we can induce ridiculous emphysema with unregulated neutrophil elastase. Um, and so plenty of protection, so who cares? And that normal protein, which has always been called M, stood for the middle of the gel, is predominantly made in the liver, about 95% of it. And though it has other jobs, alpha-1 does, its main job has been to block neutrophil elastase, which was discovered right around the same time in 67, and gave us our first hypothesis for lung disease. 
Um, and again, in animal models, you can induce an amazing amount of emphysema and lung destruction by just unregulating this. So the human experiment, if you will, the natural experiment was this. I don't make enough protection or I have more burden than my protection offers. T scale gets tipped and I get a clinical manifestation of lung disease. Again, that was classically described as early onset emphysema, but actually has multiple different uh, presentations, which we'll get into. And the thing is, we've always focused ultimately on this side, on the alpha-1 side, but obviously this, though it's not commercially available to measure, is equally important. So it comes down to the usual manners of, of what we want to be aggressive about. Clearly smoking and secondhand smoke, pollution as well, infections. I've got a lot of farmers with alpha-1 who don't smoke, they also, but they're grain farmers, you know, and they're breathing in all kinds of just... I mean, you can't ever see the farmer plowing his field. You just see the cloud of dust, right? You assume there's a tractor in there. Um, and he's breathing all that garbage in. So then when you start to look into the deficient patient, you honor various mutations. And the most common one, and the one that's most associated with uh, clinical disease, is the Z mutation. And since we're close to Canada, I'll say Z. The Z mutation. 95% um, of patients who present clinically typically have this mutation in their gene. Uh, and this is the one associated with liver disease. The S allele, which has a larger worldwide distribution, uh, is a milder deficiency but still very significant when paired with a Z mutation or many of the other mutations. As you keep looking, obviously, there's multiple other described mutations of this gene, um, the rest of the alphabet, and then various cities or the scientists who's unearthed it. Um, but essentially, S, Z, and M are the, the big players, if you will, uh, that you'll be focusing on. So... Why then is there a clinical manifestation of lung disease, you know, why, or any kind of disease? Because I'll show you that there's multiple different ways that alpha one presents. Well, without a doubt, you know, as we kind of did from that scale perspective, there's unregulated destruction. You've got a destructive enzyme that's part of the natural protection of all the garbage we're breathing in at any second, and then a regulatory, a counter-regulatory hormone, if you will, and so uncontrolled proteolytic attack. But it actually turns out that the Z mutation, remember, they don't. They don't make zero alpha-1 circulating. A lot of it gums up the liver, but there is some circulating. But what circulates also polymerizes within the pulmonary parenchyma and becomes pro-inflammatory. You talk about not fair, right? Your anti-inflammatory protein becomes pro-inflammatory indirectly. And then on top of that, the active binding site for the alpha-1 molecule on the neutrophil lattice essentially fires off like a mouse trap, um, is fivefold less functional. So it doesn't even work well. So these poor people, they, they have, don't even make much. What they make polymerizes, and it doesn't even work well. So the deck is really stacked against them. But it's a lot more than just an antiprotease. It's an acute phase reaction, so the levels do go up. So you always got to be careful of that. Very profound anti-inflammatory, lots of antioxidant capabilities. It's also a direct inhibitor of caspase 3. I'll come back to that in a second. But this is an exciting thought process about coming up with other roles for alpha-1 besides just blocking uh, neutrophil elastase. It does block other inflammatory destructive things, matrix metalloproteinases, etc. But it's a direct inhibitor, at least in uh, cellular experiments, of apoptosis in pulmonary vascular cells. It also mm -hmm. regulates alveolar and epithelial fluid volume. And where it gets really interesting is that for the longest time, the model for emphysema and COPD has always centered around a inflammatory, anti-inflammatory model. But I do a lot of bronchoscopy, and I bronch a lot of these emphysema patients for lung volume reduction clinical trials. And what I'm struck by is how uninflamed they are. When I lavage them, how boring their lavage is. I thought they were supposed to be inflamed, right? Well, when you explant some of these and you start to look, what you start to get is a different model for COPD progression. Instead of destructive, how about unregulated cell death? Now, Basic science only yet. There's not clinical correlation yet. So this may be one of these great theories that five years from now we're talking about how bad this theory was. <laughs> However, it is enticing when you look that you can induce emphysema by creating an upregulation of apoptosis. That alpha-1 is a direct inhibitor of apoptosis through uh, inactivation of caspase-3. You, know, you can upregulate caspase-3, you get more apoptosis, you get emphysema. And so, once again, whether this boils out or not, it is an interesting thought discussion that, and, and if you st start to think of all your patients, you know, much like just saying someone has asthma, that's, boy, is that a grab bag term for a lot of different clinical phenotypes. 
saying someone has COPD or emphysema is a grab bag term for a lot of different clinical phenotypes. So we'll see how this boils out. It is interesting, though. So if we've known about this disease for 50 years and it's been described, etc., how come people don't get tested for it? Now, I gave a presentation once at a COPD patient conference. There were 120 COPD patients and their families in the audience, all people that, you know, by guidelines should have been tested for alpha-1. And I said, how many people here have been tested for alpha-1? Three hands went up, my patients that were at the meeting. And, and they weren't alphas, they were normal COPD patients. And so we're taught that it's rare. And I'll show you that it's actually one of the most common diseases with a worldwide distribution. We're taught that it's only in one ethnic group. I mean, it was described in Sweden. So that it basically, unless your patient is a Viking, you don't need to bother. <laughs> but it's actually been described in every single race and ethnic group. And I'll show you some of those numbers and it'll blow you away. Suffice to say, if you're going to test someone for alpha-1, do not let their census form decide whether you should test or not. Um, the fact that this is supposed to be hard to do, it's a simple lab. Anyone can draw it. Any lab can run it. There's actually free ways to get it done through the various companies or the foundation. You know, there's not a cost barrier here. And then this would all be important enough since you actually are, of course, illuminating for a patient and their entire family tree a risk for lung disease. But the fact that there's therapy for it, that there's a, a replacement therapy for the protein you don't make enough of is what also makes this exciting from a therapeutic perspective. So let's get some numbers because I can say to you over and over, it's not rare, it's not rare, but I gotta believe, you got to believe me. So Fred DeSeres has done a lot of work trying to extrapolate allelic frequency based on screening studies and extrapolating to the population. And he said basically in his paper that there's roughly 25 million Americans who carry one abnormal gene. And absorb that for a second when you realize there's only 300 million of us. Now, Fred's work involves a lot of math, which is not my strength. So let's. Ass so I have no idea actually if the paper's wrong. Um, but <laughs> let's assume for the sake of discussion that he forgot to carry a, a one or something, and that there's only 15 million carriers. I mean, let's just erase 10 million of them. That, I think that's an overdoing factor. But let's 15 million carriers for alpha one amongst 300 million Americans is pretty bad odds that this gene will run in your family somewhere and that you're going to fall in love and start having kids with someone else who potentially is a carrier. The odds start to get pretty ugly. Uh, but these are all just estimates. There's roughly 100,000 Americans who are expected to be ZZ. Um, that's the worst kind. About 60 to 80,000 SZs are expected as well and maybe another 20,000 rare combinations. So it's not a rare disease. When you start looking, so in Sweden, they did live birth testing. You were born in Sweden, you got an alpha-1 test. One in 1,500 came back ZZ. Now, that's not common either, right? In your specialized clinic of baby Swedes only, you would have to see 1,500 kids before you'd find an alpha-1 patient statistically. That's a lot of people. Flip side, though, is that's not rare. One in 1,500? I mean, rare is some, you know, rare's winning the lottery. <laughs> rare is something like you know, lymphangioliomyomatosis. That, you see three of those, you do need to retire. You know, and so it's one of the, this, I guess, a choice of terms, right? Now, there is a, a U.S. study where they just tested blood donors. So the study's a little biased because who donates blood? Healthy people. I mean, none of my patients. And so one in 2,800 healthy blood donors came back to ZZ. And, you know, St. Louis is at least nice from the perspective, middle of the country, sort of a generic melting pot of cultures, etc. And so... Not rare, just rarely tested for. When you put it into perspective, that 100,000 ZZ patient is actually more common than sickle cell disease, something that we all see at some point during our training. Four times more common than cystic fibrosis, something we test for at birth. And only slightly less common than idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. It's not rare. It's just rarely tested for. And you can't see it because of the color, and I apologize. But this, this problem that no one tests for the disease is that the average patient goes eight years between the onset of symptoms before someone does a blood test to figure out what's wrong with them. It's a little distressing. And when you start to actually look amongst, quote, sick patients, Lieberman's classic paper of looking at consecutive COPD and emphysema patients, 2% came back ZZ, or 1.9. 8% came back carriers. There's that carrier rate. And the average age of the patients was 56 when you actually start looking at people that are interfacing with us for their difficulty breathing, what's striking is this rare disease isn't so rare. The genetic trait for it, definitely not rare. 
And this old thought process of a certain age cutoff. Oh, I don't have to test anybody above the age of 50 because, you know, they don't live that long. No, actually, they do. In other words, the, you know, what Lieberman did was set the stage for where the new guidelines are going. Alpha-1 was historically thought of as a rule-in diagnosis. You used your clinical skills and said, you know, I think you might have this. I better send the blood test. And instead, it's a rule-out diagnosis now. You know, and the analogy I always use is for a heart attack. I can't actually remember the last time I've seen one, but I've had plenty of people, oh, horrible chest pain, doc, horrible, you know. And I look at them, I'm like, you just ate a bunch of peppers. I know you don't have, you're not having a heart attack. But I send the enzymes, so I don't want to miss it, right? You know, I, I'm trying to remember the last time I've actually had an ANCA be positive, despite sending it, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's being shifted towards a rule-out diagnosis because it's not rare. <clears throat> and, of course, finding these varying levels of deficiency, the genotypes for these patients, has an important component for the family and patient health, both the family and the patient. Because as you get worse in regards to your letters, your risk for lung disease goes up and up. Now, mind you, that's risk for lung disease, not guarantee of lung disease. I have ZZs who have absolutely nothing wrong with them. They're the sibling of one of my patients. They're an unbelievable risk for lung disease, but not a zero, you know, not a, not a guarantee, I mean, that they're going to get it. Um, and when we start talking about that carrier rate, I'll show you a family tree later that'll blow you away. Yeah? How do you explain that? These people with the homozygous bad genes and they right. have no disease. Well, so the problem ultimately is, and part of where the answer we think lies is in the ongoing COPD gene trial, uh, as what I like to call the search for alpha-2. You know, um, because without a doubt, when you go to an alpha-1 patient meeting, so you have 300 ZZ patients, and you ask all the 50-year-olds who smoked 10 years to go stand over there, you know, so patients shuffle over, they ought to, you know, one gene, one disease sort of thing, they should all kind of look the same clinically and pulmonary function-wise. You'll have one that looks like they just ran here from another state, <laughs> and you'll have one that looks like if he doesn't get lungs by tomorrow, he's dead, and anywhere along the line. So without a doubt, there's a lot of other host of cofactors. Um, there's clearly um, uh, some difference among, amongst how much neutrophil elastase gets released, that there's, there's polymorphisms in that gene that some are more burst than others, um, and so that would explain some of it. Um, without a doubt, you can, if you go the caspase model, that ends up bearing fruit. There are clearly some people that have probably a higher apoptotic rate, a higher lung death rate than others, so that it's not so much an alpha-1 question. Um, it's that the, the dying side is worse, if you will. But I don't have a good explanation for it. Trust me, I've drawn a lot of her blood and sent it off for multiple different uh, lab, uh, ongoing lab trials uh, and, and clinical trials to try to help figure out why my ZZ patient who's sick and her ZZ sister who's beyond healthy and have the same lives, grew up in the same town, work in the same school, went to the same college, never smoked. One's, you know, very sick and one is, what, what's wrong with me? You know, it's really, it's a great mystery. Yeah. I just ask I, I think, I always think about sending a level. I've never actually thought, I don't believe I've sent a genetic test. And I yeah. think there's a fair bit of potential overlap or some overlap. Yes, there is. I mean, you recommend going I don't ever draw levels. And I've got, I've got some slides later to clarify that. Um, the short answer to that is, it's a genetic disorder. Don't you want to know their genetics? That's the first one. Second one is exactly what you pointed out. A level that is, quote, normal could be missing someone who's actually a carrier for a deficient disease. And though the carrier themselves may not have a lot of... Um, direct risk per se, meaning not, the problem has been is that the reason why I said there's two talks, one on the disease, one on augmentation, is that everyone's always worked on the assumption that if I'm testing you, then, and I find something weird, I'm going to treat you. No, I got a the ZZ with no lung disease. I mean, she's a ZZ. She should be on augmentation, except she has nothing wrong with her. So she's not on augmentation, right? And there's clear implications. Uh, the COPD gene trial, as it's been searching for alpha-2, um, used alpha-1 as its way to clinically validate its methodology. And it, no shock here, but MZs who smoke especially and are a much higher risk of lung disease and lung progression than an MM. They have less protection, right? So, yeah, I'll show you later, but levels miss a lot of patients. The other problem is, is that there's a wide variation not only in that, but also the methodology of how to measure the levels has an inherent error rate as well, up to as high as 20%. So that level of 100 could be much lower. And, and, you know, something that you would have reflexively done the follow-up testing.
What's going on with no no? They make no problem. They make no. They're they're guaranteed lung disease. They are. It's very rare mutation of the null. Um, and if you've obviously met, uh, had a double null, you have no alpha one protein. You have no liver disease. That's the upside, I guess, because there's no Z mutation to gum up the liver. <laughs> It's one of those, like, you got to find the positive, right? You know? <laughs> so, and then schematically, if we go back to our model, the normal healthy person, you know, the average carrier, like, carriers for just about any disease trait, doesn't matter. But there are carriers, obviously, when you have higher on the inflammatory side, big culprit being smoking, um, you start to tip that scale. So the next slide um, is, I think, a really important one because it's the clinical presentation of alpha one, And I want you to Memorize it so that you'll never miss a patient. Um, because this is, these are the symptoms that alpha-1 patients present with. You tell me if you, you know, ever see this. Dyspnea, wheeze, cough, decreased exercise. So <laughs> what is that? That's, that? that's a cardiology practice even, right? So, I mean, the problem is, so here's the first problem with alpha-1. You know, when I, you know you, when I put it into comparison to sickle cell, not subtle. CF, not subtle. Alpha-1 presents like stuff we see on a daily basis. Asthma, COPD, cough, wheeze, etc. So the biggest problem alpha one has at the beginning is that it's not dependent on our skills as clinicians to make this diagnosis. We can elicit this history. We can come up with triggers, etc. So the lung disease component, the symptomatology, fails us as a profession. When we look at clinical history from the alpha one registry, thirty-five percent of our patients carried the diagnosis of asthma. You know, this is supposed to be an emphysema disease, and amongst the whole cohort, thirty percent of the patients at some point during the follow-up exhibited bronchodilator responsiveness, at least the 15% 200 ml definition, so that at any point, you know, none of us, I think, would have faulted our colleagues if they were thinking about asthma as one of the, you know, what the disease state. So clinical labels fail us. You know, we see a patient, why are you here to see me? I've had asthma for 20 years. I need your help. I'm not breathing well. Okay, asthma, here for evaluation. But the clinical label fails us. And when you look, Historically, this is DeMeo's data, it's really nice. Um, these are all alpha-1 patients, and these are the non-smokers. And they clearly trended towards older and healthier, though you'll see some of them are quite sick. And here are the smokers in green, and though they're clearly trending towards younger and sicker, there are plenty of smoking alpha-1 patients with normal lung function. And this slide, or this, this box, I mean, excuse me, represents who traditionally gets tested for alpha-1 that someone between the ages of 40 and 50 with lung function between 60 and 20%. And yes, you'll find some alpha-1 patients missing every single one of these. And again, I'll show you a slide later. I agree with you. I'm not too worried about a 75-year-old with near-normal lung function. I don't even know why they're in my clinic. But that 75-year-old with near-normal lung function has children and brothers and sisters, and potentially grandchildren, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, our family trees get really big real quick. My wife has 64 cousins. So, <laughs> yeah, her father's one of nine. So, you know. So the other thing about COPD and alpha-1, you know, the classic teaching was alpha-1 patients get emphysema down here. Regular smokers get it at the top. And, of course, as I tell my students, the word classic in medicine means less than a third. Um, because only 20%, only 20% of alpha-1 patients have a chest x-ray that read the textbook. Now, of course... Nowadays, you walk into my emergency room and sneeze, they roll you out for PE, and so what about CT scan? You know, a full third of alpha-1 patients have apical disease. So radiographs have failed us in regards to our ability to decide who to test. By the way, if you're doing a $1,000 study to determine whether you should do a $30 study, we should talk. <laughs> about the smoking question, you see, the, you see the recurring theme here. All the things we've been taught on who to test are wrong. 80% of alpha patients are smokers or ex-smokers at the time of diagnosis with an average pack year of 23 pack years, give or take 14. So that person who smoked for 20, 30 years can be an alpha-1 patient. This notion of too much smoking excludes you from having alpha-1, not true. From the lab in Florida that's done over 120,000 tests, 47% of their patients are over the age of 50. Again, 50 is not old, but on what we're taught about alpha-1, 50s ancient. They don't, who cares? And you're right, I'm not too worried about the 88-year-old that was found here. I don't think the 88-year-old needs my help 
with any augmentation therapy. They've made it to 88 on their own. I think if anything, I'll probably just screw you up. Um, the oldest alpha one I've found is 98. And I'm not treating her. I don't even have her on an inhaler. You know, because I don't think she'll just get side effects. But the 98-year-old, think of the family tree for a second of a 98-year-old. And we actually found three more alpha one patients within her family. Two that were sick. One that has nothing wrong with her. We've been able to track and follow. The race question. So they just highlight in Chicago, one in 18 African Americans carries an abnormal gene for alpha-1. That is similar to data out of, of Africa itself. We're about to show our data out of Argentina, one in 19 Argentinians. One in 19 Puerto Ricans, one in 20 Cubans, um, one in 19 Persians are carriers for alpha-1. The only group that hasn't yet been studied are Central Asians. Um, and it's, we don't think it's not there, it just hasn't been studied. Those are the same mutations that the... Mm -hmm. ZNS. Yeah. ZNS. And then always a scattering of rares, but ZNS. And we already talked about it. People miss, and they, and they go long times before they get found. So who should be tested? The guidelines are pretty straightforward. It's everybody with COPD, everybody with asthma that doesn't fully reverse to a normal spirometry. The, the, the ATS guidelines don't make any sub-qualifiers on this. Um, and the new ones are going to be very clear about it. So rule out diagnosis. If these are what you're... Characterizing your patient as, they need this test. It's part of the liver disease workup. There's also a skin disorder associated with it. Necrotizing paniculitis. Um, it's not a common phenomenon, but necrotizing paniculitis, these painful, weepy breakdowns across the thighs, legs, buttocks, abdomen, it responds dramatically to therapy. It's actually an associated phenomenon with Wegener's disease, with seeing positive vasculitis. It's not clear the methodology, but I will tell you this. The PR3, that's the confirmatory part of Wegener's, is a serine protease and is directly inhibited by alpha-1. But without a doubt, if you have this bizarre autoimmune vasculitis, you need to be on the standard immune suppressions, etc. The alpha-1 is not the treatment of choice here. Um, it's more just the genetic implications. The bronchiectasis, like we talked about. Yes, sir. Does anything show up on the biopsy when you do these people? If you biopsy their paniculitis? So Just they, paniculitis. It doesn't show any special... I wish. I had a gentleman, the last paniculitis case I had, because I, I, this was my lack of understanding, I guess paniculitis is associated with a lot of other potentially bad disorders, including a couple of cancers. This guy underwent a lymph node dissection and a bone marrow biopsy before someone did his alpha-1 test. He was like, you're kidding. You know, his butt still hurt from the bone marrow biopsy. So no, so yeah, no, it's, um, unfortunately, there's not a hallmark to the skin. It's just paniculitis. The family history component. You know, and it's funny, I've been guilty of this too. You know, it's, right, it's, it's our dirty little secret that only a quarter of smokers get lung disease. Right, we don't want anybody to actually know that. It's sort of the, you know, you, you can actually smoke, at least from a pulmonary perspective, and get away with it um, in a lot of patients. Now, you'll get cancer or heart disease, so, you know, smoking will still get you. But... If you, if you, I've always been very guilty of, was there any lung disease in your family? Yeah, my dad had COPD and my grandfather, and you know, but they smoked or they worked in the mills or you know, something that said, yeah, of course, duh. But all the smokers who don't get lung disease. So if you've got a patient who's talking about the lung disease in their family and that uncle who had a liver problem but he was a drinker, you know, it's at a minimum, you know, there's a signal there worth exploring. So levels. Levels, of the unfortunately, it's acute phase reaction, so they rise and fall. We talked about the errors already. DNA analysis of genotyping, looking for the Z and the S mutation, and then the final confirmatory test called pie typing. Pie typing is actually looking at the protein. So you might have a genetic mutation, but this doesn't test for all the genes. But if you're suspicious or you want confirmation, you look to see that there is indeed circulating abnormal protein. You can actually test via a finger stick. It doesn't require full phlebotomy. This is the various methodologies that both the companies and the foundation, the Alpha-1 Disease Foundation, uh, use. Um, they do work. And the reason why levels are not alone, from the lab in Florida, where they do the genotyping, some labs report 90 as the lower limit of normal, some 100. You'll miss 90% of the Z carriers if you use that as your cutoff. So you say to yourself, well, I'm going to use 140. That's so normal, you know, I, can't, I won't miss a carrier that way. You actually miss about a quarter of them. So that's why the recommendations are to center around doing a genotyping. If you say, I love levels, or levels are what our lab does, and genotypes to send out, and you know, I don't want to bother, then set your levels about 150. 
your levels are 150 or up, the chance that you're a carrier becomes almost remote. You know, it, a, enough of a, of a minor error that it's not a big deal. But this is important because your lab, your lab or any lab will report it as normal. You know, that level of 130 is in the normal range. So we won't have the L or the H by it that flag us all automatically. And, you know, I think, at least I'll, I'll, I'll throw it out there. I'm very guilty of, I get a stack of labs. You know, I don't know that my patient's sodium is 140. I just know that it was an L or H, you know. And so did you, as you're flipping through, know truly what the alpha-1 test was? The other benefit to testing for alpha-1 is you can get more people interested in quitting smoking. That doesn't mean that we'll quit smoking, just the act of being interested. And the thing that's interesting is this one right here. There was always this concern that being told you didn't have this, you would, you know, hey, sweet, let's go celebrate. <laughs> Light up. Um, <laughs> the, spontaneous, the spontaneous rate at which our patients think about quitting is 5%, with no minimal counseling. You just say, you know you have lung disease, you ought to quit smoking. No, you don't do, it, you don't do anything beyond that. It's 5%. It goes up by a factor of 5 when you say, I tested you for this disease, and it's great news, you actually don't have it. But, you know, I tested you because you have lung disease. And this directly can affect it. And they got people more interested. Now, maybe they didn't pull it off, but you and I both know that no counseling or drugs work unless they're interested in doing it. And why does testing matter? Let me introduce you to Donovan's family. So Donovan's right here, a friend of mine. He's a carrier. Fell in love with a nice girl. Happened to be a carrier. No, it's not his cousin. Um, I ask. And so, uh, so a carrier randomly marries another carrier, and they get lucky. Their children are carriers, so they didn't have an alpha-1 child, and they clearly could. Donovan and his brother are the product of his father, who's an alpha-1 patient, who's only alive because of his lung transplant a couple years ago, and his normal mother. But alpha Donovan's father, one brother dead from alpha-1, the one brother carrier alive, sister dead from alpha-1, brother dead from alpha-1. And the reason is, his alpha-1 grandmother married a carrier and wiped out the whole next generation. This alpha-1 brother married a carrier. Three children, dead at the age of two of liver disease, transplanted at the age of eight, and alive and well. This carrier married actually another type of carrier, an S carrier. I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, I, to the point, like, I've made many jokes at his expense about how many of these people are cousins. Um, the carrier rate is very much out there. And the disease, once it's in your family tree, all it takes is another person marrying in, and voila. But what I always think about, and the reason why I said, you know, when I found a 98-year-old, who cares clinically for her, the individual? No issue. But anywhere along the line, he, he was discovered while working up for his liver tra or lung transplant. This one was already dead. This one was dead. This one was dying. This one was dead. And if anywhere along the line for their lung disease in this family tree, an intervention had been made, just a simple diagnostic test, you can imagine there have been a lot of different outcomes, um, both in the lifestyle that some of these people led, because a lot of them were smokers, or screening and or you know, maybe these guys... Uh, would have decided to adopt instead of have children. Who knows? doesn't matter. They at least would have had the ability to have that discussion. So if you go finding, and I hope you're going to start testing, and you're gonna, you know, now you're going to find one. So now what? Enter the panic, right? Um, well, let me help you. Um, no, you're not going to be sending a patient to Chicago, but I'm salaried. I'm owned by the University of Chicago. So if you want a free consult, what do I care? Um, so... <laughs> Email me or call me on my cell phone or email me. They're the two best ways to reach me. I would tell people, even in the local area, I'll see your patient if you want, but I really don't have any incentive to. Um, so, no, all kidding aside, if I can help. I'm on the phone a couple times a week with people all over the country because I run a large center for a reason. This is what I do. So if I can help, I want to help. All right, so what do you do? So immediately everyone gets all excited about the augmentation therapy. woo I I got an alpha-1 patient. Let's get them started. Forgetting all the basics, the stuff that we're all, you know, collectively good at, taking care of their underlying lung disease, aggressively pursuing their asthma, immune modulation, getting their environment cleaned up, aggressively pursuing infections, putting them all the right meds, etc., etc., etc. You know, we've got guidelines for it. We never, without a doubt, got to get them to quit smoking. Um, and, but in the end, what's unique to this disease state is the augmentation therapy. The generic name for all of the products that are available in the United States is augmentation therapy. Well, actually, the generic name is alpha-1 protease inhibitor human. Um, the brand names that you'll ever hear of, if any of the people ever call in your offices, stand for the manufacturing process. That's it. It's a 
It's not a drug, right? It's a protein. Any more than IgG is a drug. They, yes, there's different formulations, and yes, there's different brands, but in the end, you're replacing IgG if you have that patient, right? Or hereditary angioedema, you're just replacing a factor that's missing, at least in some of the products. So the idea here is kind of the same. You don't make enough, let's give it back to you, see if we can alter uh, some things. So if this was our deficient patient, then the model is just to give the orange version, give it IV. So back in 87, so this is also another banner year, it's the 50th anniversary of the discovery of alpha-1. It's the 25th anniversary of the first infusion of therapy for alpha-1. So Mark Weavers and the NIH group published their data showing that we could do this. This didn't prove anything about it working. It just said you could do it. Your patients don't explode, die, get auto get antibodies, anaphylax, etc. The level were really low. 60 mg per K weight-based intravenous infusion of a purified human protein, so blood donors. Makes the levels go sky high. But due to the obviously short half-life of proteins in general and the lack of underlying manufacturing, levels drop. You give them again and again and again and again and again and go on and so forth. And they proved that you could tolerate it and the levels went up appropriately and it allowed, it allowed a dosing strategy um, requiring essentially a weekly infusion. People have looked at other methodologies, bi-weekly or monthly, the levels go to all over the place. So it's essentially weekly. And there's been a lot of studies that have tried then to back up clinically that this makes a difference. Because just because you can do it doesn't mean it works, right? And of course, originally the thought process was, well, we replace IgG, we replace for hemophiliacs, um, you know, we replace red blood cells on a leukemic in the ICU. This is kind of the same idea. Yeah, but all right, well, let's look at the animal models. So animal model really quick, you have an alpha-1 mouse, you treat some, not the other, and you expose them all to smoke. I always had that vision of a little mouse holding a little tiny cigarette. Um, when they, it turns out when you do treat an alpha-1 mouse, you can make the levels go up. But most importantly, when you then wash out the lungs, the treated mouse, the neutrophils and all the matrix breakdown products basically go away. You protect the mouse. And when you sacrifice the mice, the alpha-1 mouse exposed to smoke but no product has a lot of emphysema. The alpha-1 mouse exposed to smoke but getting the infusions of alpha-1, you don't get it. It's really amazing. That's great, but I don't take care of mice either. So how about people? So the first human trial to at least try to look at efficacy came out in 97 in Europe. And it's clearly got limits because it's pro it is prospective, but it's not randomized. And it was basically across two countries. The German group, who could get augmentation therapy, and the Danish group, where it wasn't available. But similar patient characteristics, but um, not truly randomized. The randomization occurred by where you were born. <laughs> um, you got weekly infusions, and there was about 300 patients. And they stratified people into three separate lung function categories. What I like to call the very sick, the sick, and the not so sick. Because obviously 31 to 65 percent lung function, that's definitely a large core group that we all interface with. This is very advanced end stage. This is relatively healthy. Very few numbers in the relatively healthy. I'll come back to that in a second. But when you focus right on the middle, what you see is at least the first human data longitudinally looking at change in lung function over time that the FEV1 on people getting therapy every year declined less than the group not getting therapy, at least implying, though clearly not proving, that you were potentially changing the natural history in the FEV1 decline by giving them the augmentation. There wasn't an effect seen on FEV1 in the advanced stage. Let's face it, when you don't have much FEV1 left, <laughs> detecting a change is pretty difficult. I'll come back to that. This group was harder one to, to wrap our heads around only because they all were losing lung function at a fast pace, and it was also very small numbers. I'll show you data later equally as lousy in the sense of 23 patients um, to, that counteracts this data. Suffice to say, I will tell you, at least in clinical practice, the people that are like 70% FEV1, if they've been 70% FEV1 for the last 10 years, then we watch them. But if they've been 70%, if they were 75% the last year or two, then we do actually start to treat from the perspective that why am I going to wait until you're sicker to try to slow you down? But I'll show you data that will back that up. After the Searsone paper, the Alpha-1 registry data came out. This is the largest study to date, almost 1,000 patients, 927 patients. 
And I'm going to jump, for the sake of time, to the mortality data, because there, there were two endpoints. They looked at FEV1, and they had similar data, though different cutoffs, so they're not easily comparable. But they had mortality data. And, and this is not a randomized study. You were either, at the beginning of the study, never on augmentation until the time it ended. You came in on augmentation, that's the always, or you worked on it, and somewhere in the study you got put on it. And this is a group of less than 50% lung function, so definitely advanced disease. The mortality difference was this cumulative mortality. The p-value is clearly statistically significant, and it's definitely clinically significant that this many people, 45% of them cumulatively, were dead versus about 20% dead at the five-year mark, a clear divergence of the, on the mortality curve. Um, I'll come back to the slide in a second, though, because it obviously wasn't a randomized trial, but clearly doesn't prove that the augmentation is the, is the effect here. But it was very enticing to at least see an advanced lung disease patient, which could make a difference in that. Van Wenker did a nice study. It was small, but each person acted as their own control. She retrospectively looked at your lung function decline, started you on therapy, followed you prospectively. When you look at the entire composite group, their FEV1 loss was accelerated prior, started on therapy, acting as their own control, and prospectively followed with a decline in the rate of FEV1 loss per year. You remember the original Searsome paper that said 23 patients with, quote, good lung function doesn't seem to matter. Marion had 11, so I'll see your lousy data and raise you. Um, and hers showed actually a pretty profound effect of people burning through lung and then got started on therapy and had a dramatic slowing. And that's what's essentially guided us in that so-called healthy range. You know, you're 75, 80% FEV1, and we can have retrospective data that says that's where you've been, and we watch you. If we have retrospective data that says you definitely work better, you've been declining, and you know, you're not smoking, I mean, all the obvious things are not there, then we use Miriam's data to say maybe it makes a difference in this so-called healthy group. I think maybe the key point is, is that whereas alpha-1 evolved from test only a certain type of patient to now a rule-out diagnosis, it also used to be te treat every ZZ you find, because that's why you tested them, to wait, 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 let's have a thoughtful discussion on who should be treated or not, what's our clinical goal here, what's clinically happening to our patient. And so it's been a nice shift in, in the disease state. Now, when I go back to this, this study, the NIH study, there's definitely a, you know, let's, let's all put our journal club hat on. I will interpret this study for you in a pessimistic way. This study doesn't represent augmentation working. This study represents the fact that if you don't have insurance in the United States, you're more likely to die. Because these are alpha-1 patients, and I will tell you that the reason they weren't on therapy is it's expensive, and they didn't have insurance. So these are people not getting vaccines, inhalers, and don't get to see any of us. And I, you can't, I can't refute that, right? That's, that's a legitimate way in a non-randomized trial but we can't control other factors. It's small data, but the one nice thing the Canadians gave us is their registry data. The one thing, you know, whatever your political view on the Canadian healthcare system, we can all agree on one thing. They all have it. And so access to healthcare is not the question here. The only, and the access to augmentation was province-based. So there is still not randomized here. But the people getting augmentation therapy who are alpha-1 patients, their annual rate of FEV1 decline was normal, 30 ml is a predicted rate. And if they weren't on augmentation therapy, it was more than double. And they're getting their inhalers, they're seeing their vaccines and their docs, etc. It's, it's close. Now, I don't have a slide for it yet. There's one more piece of data I'd like to tell you about. <coughs> There's a study that will be presented actually at the American Thoracic Society meeting in Philadelphia next month. Um, it's a, it is a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Um, uh, the prior randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial that was attempted had 56 patients. You already can tell that it's a pointless study. Um, had monthly infusions. It's a weekly infusion. This one was almost 200 patients followed for uh, two years tracking CT densitometry as the outcome. Did you get more emphysema over time on a high-resolution scan? Yes or no. Getting augmentation? Yes or no, or albumin. Everyone got infused. These were newly diagnosed ZZ patients. The data, so I've, I've not seen the data. I've only read the abstract. So take this all with a grain of salt. Hasn't been peer-reviewed. Hasn't been put into a uh, publication. Has been accepted, though, at the American Thoracic Society meeting. Um, suffice to say, what it showed, 
augmentation therapy prevented the progression of emphysema as measured by high-resolution CT, which is something we all kind of figured it would. It was nice to see. Now, what's the clinical relevance of that? There's some data that says, obviously, CT densitometry is clearly pertinent. I'll be a pessimist and say, dying with a better-looking CAT scan doesn't mean anything to me. <laughs> um, so that's why I want to see all of the data. I want to see the other clinical endpoints. My other concern is it's only a two-year trial. There's another randomized trial that will be coming down the pipeline that will be a three-year study. Um, we'll see what that data shows. But it has been nice. Alpha-1 has always suffered historically from a lack of a double-blind randomized, you know, um, and it's been done. Um, so um, at least the initial sky-high view of the data is exciting. I'll leave it at that. What severity are those patients? Uh, they all had to have FEV1s less than 65%, or 70%. So is it, I mean, with the previous data, is it ethical to not treat, you know? <laughs> well, you, you'll see why there was um, very little recruitment within the United States. Um, most of the recruitment occurred in countries where there was no product available. So then it's obviously ethical if it's if you're, your placebo is what you're doing on a daily basis anyway. And then they gave free product to those. You know, you got randomized. It was one of those, you know, I'm in country X. You either get placebo, which is what you've been getting, <laughs> or you get product. They didn't have a hard time recruiting for the deficient patients. It was very hard to recruit within the United States um, because of that. And, and there was the issue of if their insurance approved it or if the patient was willing. I mean, the patient could choose. I'm not, we, were, we tried to be part of the study. I couldn't get any patients interested. They were like, what? I'm not going to go on a placebo arm. Wait, this is FDA approved, right? Yes. My insurance will cover it, right? Yes. Doc, what? <laughs> you know, and so it's hard. Is anybody thinking of doing a randomized controlled trial with more mild patients uh, who wouldn't necessarily get treated otherwise? Probably not in the near future. Um, it was a ridiculously expensive trial. Um, and right now, they, these were all... So all of these products got approved for biochemical equivalents, and the FDA re-examined that and said, you know, we want to see a randomized efficacy trial. And so these trials got designed with the FDA, um, so all the companies are ultimately going to have to do it. What about COPD patients without the mutation? So there is a trial. So you want to, let me, I'll expand it even further beyond COPD. There's a, there is a trial of um, using alpha-1 therapy for cystic fibrosis. Um, and extrapolating from that, to, uh, there is a trial starting to explore using it for COPD patients. The thought process has been, if you measure alpha-1 levels in a CF kit, they're through the roof. I mean, they're, they're talking about an acute phase reaction. I mean, you've seen their lung. They're goo. The argument there is, even though they got plenty of alpha-1, their neutrophil elastase levels are through the roof. And so augmenting theirs would help them. There's been an argument that there must be a subset. And what, so what, what I would argue is rather than start doing a clinical trial of using this for an MM patient, better yet, come up with a, a better bio readout to show me that your neutrophil elastase levels are elevated. Because I will tell you, as, you know, as I kind of glossed over a carrier clinically, other than risk for lung disease that they smoke and then obviously the broader family, I have three carriers on augmentation therapy. Now, why? That doesn't make any sense. Every single year of prior pulmonary function testing and then the two years that I followed them, the RFV1 kept declining. They weren't smoking. They weren't infected. There's nothing going on. And so I approached them and the insurance company and said, I, it's lung transplant in another couple of years if we don't try something. Even though this makes no sense, though I have a theory of why it makes sense. I'll tell you in a second. Started those three out of the hundreds of carriers I have. Those three started on augmentation, and they've not declined. Now, that's not proof. They might have declined that year, not declined that year on their own. I think it works that way. But the theory, at least, that I have is since we always measure alpha-1 sides, but not this side. So what if this is a cohort of people that have high caspase 3 levels or high neutrophil elastase levels or high whatever else it's blocking, and that their level of alpha-1, though normal, isn't normal for them, the individual? I don't know, but... To me, the extrapolation of that is the idea of using it for CF because their levels are very normal and yet we're doing a trial that might not work, but nobody gets to that level of a clinical trial without some data, right? And the argument's been is that their inflammatory proteins are through the roof. So that's, I can't prove it to you. That's my theory about why these carriers have needed therapy. For an MM though, it would be too much of a shot in the dark. I would need a better readout that you are indeed have high neutrophil elastase levels or a better biomarker. You know, 
there have been attempts to look at elastin breakdown products. Destroys elastin, let's measure how much. They don't correlate well enough. And so um, if you could give me a better readout, you know, start someone on a statin, cholesterol goes down. Doesn't go down enough, more statin, you know. And, and ideally, you would get that from a dosing perspective. I mean, 60 mg per gig is one size fits all. And without a doubt, you know, anecdotally, there's been patients where higher doses made a difference. But I also know there's patients that I'm over, overdosing, wasting. Is there any data that the progression of liver disease corresponds with the progression of lung disease? They seem to be separate. Um, and in fact, separate to the point where that's always been the norm of I'm liver affected or I'm lung affected. There's occasionally some that have both. What the confounder is, and this is where it gets interesting, we don't see a lot of adult liver disease in Europe. We see a lot more adult liver disease in the U.S. But then when you start to biopsy the liver, you find not only the alpha-1, you also start to find steatohepatitis, fatty liver. You know, and you start to, let's run with the stereotypes of the average American body versus the average European body and obesity. Um, so is it, you know, as what I always explain clinically to my patients, because I say you technically have a liver disease. Whether that's going to matter clinically it will take time. I said, but you need to protect your liver. So I vaccinate them, obviously, for hep B. I tell them, when you get put in prison, no tattoos. Um, I tell them, you know, can they say, can I drink alcohol? I'm like, yeah, you can drink a glass of wine. Should you drink the whole bottle? No. But then again, no one should. They're like, well, what about for my anniversary? Yeah, once a year, knock yourself out. Go ahead. But, you know, it's sort of just be prudent. You know, should I take Tylenol? Yeah, you can take Tylenol. Should I take it four times a day? Probably not. You know, they, can I go on Lipitor? Yes, you can go on Lipitor. You know, it's... it's it's the, the guidelines are shifting. It's going to be yearly LFTs, but it's also going to be a yearly ultrasound of the liver, which isn't going to pick up much in the way of cirrhosis, but there seems to be also a slightly elevated risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. So they want us to do ultrasounds on these folks. So um, and they definitely don't correlate it. Of course, therapy doesn't fix the liver at all. If you have liver disease, it's the generic, you know, treatment for liver disease. You get transplanted, you're no longer an alpha-1 patient, liver transplant. Um, unless you get, there is one case, they don't test for alpha-1 amongst donors. Alpha-1 patient got an alpha-1 liver. Ooh. Can you believe that? I mean, I was like, go buy a lottery ticket. <laughs> yeah. Are they working on any sub preparations for the operation? Um, I know that it's been something that a couple of the companies have been throwing around. They all say that we're going to think about it, but then when you look at their timelines, they talk about, like, in 2016, we're going to, and I think to myself, well... I'll believe that when I see it. Um, it's the usual issue. I, I have a feeling there, there are some technical hurdles, but then it's also an issue of um, do they think the, that there's a need for it in the marketplace, right? I mean, the, the decisions of what gets developed is beyond the science, obviously. Um, so I don't know. There's, um, you know, the, the delivery model is, is typically home-based infusions, though clearly also center-based, you know, doctor's office, et cetera. Um, that are run through specialty pharmacies. There's sort of a really good built-in system for this that seems to work. And I'm not sure that anyone wants to disrupt it much. How about so. nebulizing them? So there is a nebulized therapy that's being developed. Um, it's getting close to market, supposedly. There's a couple of concerns about it. Um, right now it's a weekly infusion, which sounds very cumbersome until someone tells you that it's going to be a BID nebulization every single day, twice a day, for about 20 minutes and that there's a significant cough associated with it. And no one showed me the data yet about, number one, how good is the distal penetration of the product? These people have airflow obstruction, for goodness sakes, right? Because we already tried inhaling insulin. Look how well that worked out. And then um, the other problem I've got is how, how well does it get systemically absorbed? Because seeing that alpha-1 can be involved in a vasculitis and a skin disorder and a lot of other thoughts then it's clear to me that its only purpose is not just to protect the lungs. That might be our major clinical manifestation, but it would make me nervous that if it's only being deposited here, not getting systemically absorbed, that might be an unfounded fear, um, but we'll see. You know, it, it does come back. It's interesting. I've talked to a lot of my patients, and after the initial poke of, like, the first couple of times, like, oh, gosh, an IV, they actually, a lot of them learn to do it themselves. A lot of my patients infuse on the weekends at home watching TV. You know, it only takes 20 to 30 minutes. It's not a long process. And so it's a lot less cumbersome. So then they say, well, you know, and nebulization sounds great. If it was once a week, no one would get the needle. 
but it's every day, every single day. And, you know, it's, a, it's an apparatus if you travel and all, et cetera. So I don't know if it's going to make a huge splash. Um, we'll see. I mean, you know, I, think, I don't think it's going to change it dramatically. I'm, I'm sure from the perspective of the various companies, you know, if, if X amount of market share gets taken, they'll care because obviously that's the name of the game for these guys. But, but I, think, I don't think we're going to see some wholesale shift over when, if and when Nebulized product makes it to market. One Bill, more uh, Anderson, one of our outside audience, asked oh. about insurance and what do you do about genetic counseling. Mm -hmm. And then I've got a question. We were getting free testing kits, yeah. uh, and I don't see them anymore. The company's no longer sponsoring that. No, product. they very much do it. Um, it's a product of a couple of different things. Um, so let me answer all the different questions. So insurance-wise, it's covered through insurance. The um, the Medicare on down. Um, I don't know about Seattle Medicaid or sorry Washington Medicaid. Presumably though, it's if, it's covered in Illinois. If Illinois covers it, having Illinois Medicaid is like being uninsured. And so um, <laughs> the and so they cover it. Um, the uh, the process of getting it approved. The part of the whole specialty pharmacy that that pro services all of the products is that that's a lot of what they do. Um, you know, I will tell you this. I fill out a form, I send it in, and, and that's it. I've not been on the phone. I don't find it. It's not like trying to get Zolaire, which, you know, everybody in your office wants to kill you um, because of the work involved. This is actually a pretty straightforward process. I'm sure somebody at all these various specialty pharmacies that service it has a really awful job of try dealing with the insurance companies, but it's not me. Um, so we do have pretty much near universal insurance coverage. You'll get rare exceptions. But um, if they're uninsured, again, the various companies as well as all these uh, the foundation and other support networks exist. I've not yet had a patient who we needed to get on therapy and we couldn't get them on therapy in some way, shape, or form. From a genetic counseling perspective, this is one of the most unique disorders in the level of organization around it. There is an entire support network designed by patients for the patients. The foundation has a ridiculous amount of support, and they actually pay for a genetic counseling service um, through the Medical University of South Carolina. Free, call in, it's all available. And the amount, and the, this is one of those disease states that's interesting. Last year, the patient support meeting was in Seattle. There were 400 alpha 1 patients in a hotel somewhere, you know, sucking down oxygen, um, <laughs> all gathering together to learn more about the disease. It's an amazing organization. Um, in regards to the test kits, the three, there's four products, but there's three companies. One services two of them. The three companies, two of them contract a lab to do the test kits. One is a lab in Utah, the other is a lab in Florida. Um, so the company, the reps from those companies would be the one that would supply your test kits. If they haven't been you supply, supplying your test kits, it's either because those reps don't know to call on you or um, the rules have changed on who's allowed past the front desk because that's been an evolving thing in everybody's hospital. You know, our hospital decided reps are evil and has kicked them all out. Whatever. But um, the other company um, doesn't do test kits anymore uh, for technical reasons and is do coming up with a different methodology uh, to, to cover testing. And so um, what I would say is if you're interested in having uh, getting more testing done, and I hope you are, um, there are multiple different ways, and I would simply approach the various members of industry um, from all three companies so you can compare um, and see what works best for your clinic. But they're very, they are available. Are those genetic tests? Yeah. yeah. And, they're they're and they're free. And they're free. Now, they're not obviously free in general. They're, the lab is charging the company, but they're free for you and your patients. I know it's not commercial, but would you then remind us the two companies we should ask? Because I'd like to have these kits again. So the one test kit is made by Baxter, and the other one is made by Griffiths. Those are the two companies, the commercial companies. CSL doesn't have a test kit, but CSL is working on a program where they're going to um, underwrite the cost of you testing in your own lab. So rather than a test kit, you'll order it, and they'll pay for it. It's kind of the same idea. Any attempt at gene therapy in animals or anything like this? There's actually been ongoing human gene therapy trials, and they've been inching forward at a snail's pace and beyond. Um, we haven't seen a lot of progress for sort of the expected reasons of both um, high-profile deaths in other gene therapy trials that have kind of not an alpha one, but it sort of hampered the whole process. I mean, without a doubt, this seems to be a natural solution, right? Or even better, come up with ways, you know, stem cell therapies for hepatocytes. All you need is normal hepatocytes. 
you know, if, if living related half donors was a safer surgery than it is, you could get half a liver from somebody as an alpha one patient and be cured too. You know, we've done not for alpha one, we've done half livers at our hospital. Um, take half the liver of a healthy adult parent, obviously, usually of a dying kid, put it into the kid. Now it's fraught with complications, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that's why it doesn't get done. But you know, if you could do a stem cell infusion that would work and hepatocytes would grow, get fixed. You know, it'd be great if you could obviously figure out a way to grow lung too. But and that's actually why we, we talk so much about testing. Because like my healthiest patients have all come from a primary care doctor. Right? I mean, when they come into our clinics, we're, you know, we don't see people with normal lung function anymore. I mean, the primary care doctors hold on to all that. I mean, scattering here and there, but a pulmonary practice, an allergy practice, you know, from a breathing perspective, we get cast-offs. Primary care is done with them. So they're usually sicker, which is why it's even more imperative to find them. So we find them at least with 50 or 60% lung function. You know, I can help you at 30%, but not a lot, right? But if you had someone tested you at 75%, that'd be great. Yeah. What adverse effects are that reported with um, It's usually seen in 1% or less, but it's typically infusion type reactions. Flushing, warmth, redness, itchiness. It. Yeah, it's really dramatic to the point where that's why um, almost universally they're infused at home because it's so easily tolerated. There is, um, uh, the products obviously contain purified alpha 1 protein. The quote impurities are a little bit of albumin, a little bit of IgG, but also um, some IgA. So before you infuse somebody, you do test for their IgA levels because if they have anti-IgA antibodies, which my understanding you guys would know better than me, very rare. The IgA relative deficiency, more common, but anti-IgA antibodies, very rare. Essentially, I was told by an allergist once that if, if the IgA levels are undetectable, they probably have the antibody. That group's at a higher risk for an anaphylactic-like reaction because you're then infusing some IgA into them. Now, I have one patient that had a relative IgA deficiency. And we infused them the first few times, standing over with Epi. <laughs> but, and they did great. So and they're infusing the literature is a bit, too. Well, to good to know. <laughs> you can keep checking if it's a right, Well, that's the problem. It's in the product insert is the problem, right? I mean, it's, I, I get the distinct feeling that it is yeah. bunk. Yeah. But, you know, it's one of those, I'm going to be the, the attending of record infusing the product. I want to make sure I'm following, you know, checking off my boxes. <laughs> so, um, I was hoping I was able to get across. It's present. You just got to test. It's not just severe emphysema in young patients, because that's obvious. It's quick and it's simple to do. Um, I didn't uh, show you the data, but all those babies in Sweden, um, now they're adults. And you'll be happy to know they've made better career choices. You know, they're not in polluted environments. The smoking rate is not zero, unfortunately, but it's a lot better than the rest of Sweden, which is like 100% anyway. Um, and so people armed with the knowledge that I'm at risk for lung disease clearly have made better choices. And then ultimately augmentation therapy is available uh, for the disease because it can make all the difference in the world to test. Thanks for your time. I really appreciate this opportunity. Well, thanks. Uh, let's take a momentary break, and we'll be presenting a case. If you... Please. My flight's not till like 11. <laughs> Unless the air traffic controllers are furloughed, in which case you'll be here till tomorrow. You know, it's hilarious. I uh, they were hearing about this. You know, there's not going to be enough air traffic control or not going to be enough TSA agents as well, right? I'm leaving. You know, I've got off my plane. You have to walk. You know, you walk out. There's, you know, it's a one way, but there's always a guard there. There were three guards there walking, blocking the way out. I was like, really? There's a shortage of TSA agents and three of you are making sure someone doesn't Rush the wrong direction. Yeah. The dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> Absolutely. Will it work? Make sure you're right. Thunderbolt. Yep. Yeah, Thunderbolt. We're set. Do you need power? Are you okay? Yeah.
symptoms. He's always just been given steroids, antibiotics. They've said you're having an asthma exacerbation, uh, and it sort of maybe helps a little bit, and it's temporary. Uh, he associates this quote-unquote decompensation with losing his job. He's moved in with his mom. It's sort of a small, dusty, moldy room. Um, he thinks it's allergies. He's actually tried to quit smoking, but everybody in the house smokes a lot, so there's a fair bit of secondhand. Um, he has allergic rhinitis, allergic asthma, um, hypertension, ADHD. Uh, his medications are nothing too remarkable, although I didn't certainly think about the lisinopril there. Um, and, and this is just what he's been sort of up to in terms of his inhalers over the last couple of months before I saw him by his uh, primary care. Family history, a lot of people with allergies and asthma, nothing more profound has ever been diagnosed in them. Certainly no other pulmonary diseases that have been found, autoimmune or immune deficiencies. Uh, his work history is potentially relevant. Uh, he's sort of been an electrician, but just kind of working under the table, uh, sort of odd jobs and houses, apartments. He doesn't know of any exposures, but certainly could have been around asbestos and the like. Certainly never used a mask or any other protection. Uh, he's been unemployed since sort of late 2011, um, when this all started to pick up. Uh, and he's again currently living with cats, dogs, and a lot of smoking uh, in the house. Um, he hasn't used drugs or anything else of the sort. Um, as I looked at it this morning, I realized I, I skipped over his exam. Um, but before I show you the spirometry, he, he didn't, on the face of it, look like an asthmatic. You could tell something else was going on. He was definitely pretty large, a uh, little barrel-chested, and notably, and he was his saturation was okay at rest. But when he walked, he immediately became dyspneic, and his saturation dropped into the sort of high high 80s. Um, and I was struck mostly by the uh, prominence of inspiratory sounds rather than all just sort of expiratory wheeze. Um, his spirometry, as you can see, was quite abnormal. Uh, so what was his FEV1 there? That is 27% predicted, and this is on a pretty good dose of uh, inhaled steroids and a long-acting bronchodilator. Um, and then, you know, so the first thing I thought is obviously there's more going on. I actually tried to get the guy admitted that day but he vehemently refused because he clearly needed an expedited workup. 
we got a chest X-ray that day, and it immediately changed the differential. And this is you know, a classic thing that would happen as a resident. I've seen this many times. All of a sudden, you find there's an interstitial process going on. So just briefly for what I thought, uh, seeing this guy in clinic, seeing this X-ray, and how I've always sort of approached interstitial lung diseases, my, my sort of differential, and, and I really think ILD is not a very useful term. It's more sort of a diffuse parenchymal process. So from medical school, I remember the thing they always teach us is this way down in the quarter, sort of the interstitial idiopathic processes, and, and really uh, learned in, as a resident to expand my differential way beyond that. Um, so first off, you always have to sort of rule out mimics like heart failure, um, other things in the interstitium. And I welcome any input here if people have other thoughts about how they think about this sort of disease. This is just how I've been taught to think about it. Uh, sort of the acute processes, um, which he didn't really fit. Um, and then I kind of break it down by sort of different infectious and immunologic things that can happen. So uh, certainly there are a number of atypical infections that you have to think about, such as pneumocystis, fungal infections, parasitic disease, uh, that we often think about as immunologists. Various exposures that are both sort of allergic in nature and not, so the, the classical inorganic dust that we're taught, uh, and then the more hypersensitivity reactions we talk about farmers and what they're entailing, pigeon fanciers, all these things that we sort of learn about as medical students. A variety of medications, common ones being methotrexate, uh, and a variety of others hadn't been on that, and then sort of uh, recreational drugs. I always think about eosinophilic specific diseases separately because I think they're pretty easy to pick up, um, and we certainly see quite a few of these uh, as allergist immunologies. Systemic autoimmune diseases, which usually present with extra pulmonary findings as well, uh, and then a variety of specific entities, and that's where I fit in alpha-1 antitrypsin, sarcoidosis, and some of these very rare things. Yep, that's a good way to break it down. So yeah, that, that's sort of how I approach this guy and, and uh, push the work up in that direction. And again, I wanted it to be expedited, but this guy was tough to get in. Um, so things I think about when I work up a guy like this, again, I always step back and say, how do we expand our... our thinking and our differential. Um, so these are just a variety of things that I think about, certainly further characterizing his lungs, like full PFT is a CT scan, um, and then uh, lab workup as well. Uh, usually, often, and, and in this case, it sort of ends up as a biopsy diagnosis, and that's where we're going to end up. But just to the, the less and less these days. So biopsy yeah. for the, for the, your, if you backed up one, your, your list for the idiopathic interstitial pneumonias. Yeah. Less and less often now are we doing biopsies to make this diagnosis because higher resolution CT has gotten so good. Yeah. Um, and frequently, um, biopsy doesn't change the management. And depending on the disease state, especially if you have IPF, the biopsy can precipitate an acute uh, exacerbation of the disease and can actually lead to them dying. So your diagnostic workup can kill your patient. Right, I have seen that. The yeah. guidelines are now if they have the classic honeycombing, then yep. you just, just treat it's it. It's become a radiologic diagnosis yeah. if the CAT scan is that yeah. classic. And unfortunately, I know in that field, despite a lot of trials, nothing has really proved beneficial. And, um, um, nothing yet. In fact, if you have IPF as a diagnosis, the current guidelines is one sentence. It says put them in hospice, transplant them, or put them in a trial. Those are your three choices with that disease now. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, work up. So him, you know, first thing we got was a CT, and it was pretty striking. And I just picked a few representative images. This is sort of at a upper mid-level cut. Um, as you go down in the lungs, um, a lot of uh, uh, abnormalities, and I'll sort of come to what it showed. And then just because we always like to look at the apices, they were actually relatively spared. Or sorry, not the apices, but the bases. Um, it was more in the uh, uh, upper lobe predominance. And there was a lot of fibrosis, uh, thickening, and then also a good number of lymph nodes. And the radiologist gave me a pretty wide differential for this, um, but certainly things like uh, organic dust and inorganic dust exposures and sarcoidosis, things like that were on it. Uh, further PFTs I got, so I definitely had a restrictive uh, component to some degree. And then, and I'm actually curious from a pulmonologist, I always have a little trouble interpreting a DLCO. Right. Because there are so many ways that it can be adjusted based right. on the alveolar dilation, the hemoglobin. But uh, so the D the DLC uncorrected is always by itself. None of the not with the volume, you know, uh, correction factor is. In our group, um, we find the volume thing to be pretty useless. We only do the DLC uncorrected only needs to be corrected for hemoglobin 
if you know you have obvious anemia. Right. And as a young guy, chances of his anemia is essentially none. Um, and so his DLCO being reduced. And it was interesting when you put up his spirometry. I was struck by the profound obstruction that he had, but also the significant amount of restriction and volume loss. His X-ray was also striking because there's actually diaphragmatic tension. He's got a significant volume loss on that original X-ray. You so saw those where the diaphragms are being pulled up. There's a lot of volume loss around the mid-lung zones. What's interesting is how, at least relatively speaking, the apices are completely spared, at least by that this radiograph. Not completely. There's some scarring, but that this is. Upper lobe predominant, but but the lower portion, so like posterior segments, etc. Um, it's a, it's a definite, like you said, it, you know, there's been so many flags to say that this guy's beyond asthma. Yeah. The hypoxemia alone, right? I mean, asthmatics don't get hypoxemia. Yeah. So, and unfortunately, this is how I found these classically present. They sort of linger on for months and months, seeing urgent care and so. Well, and it's also the same story as as the alpha one patient of, yeah. well, you've got asthma, so here's some more steroids. You know, especially when you go to a doc in a box. You go to a doc in a box wheezing, you and you say I'm an asthmatic. Yeah. You know, that's autopilot. Stamp, move on. I can get you triaged in two seconds and out the door, which is their job, unfortunately. So, I mean, it's also striking, you know, that obviously the market reduced vital capacity, and it tells you how much the restrictive disease is predominating because his RV is obviously still elevated, as he's we've got to know he has bad obstructive disease. But his TLC has shrunk that much so that he's got ongoing, you know, volume mm -hmm. loss. Um, it's interesting. There's one other, just uh, to add a wrinkle to it for, to recognize the pattern. When the total lung capacity is reduced and the residual volume is elevated, the other at least thing to have in your differential is um, neuromuscular weakness. Um, and, and that might be a component of what's going on, though not with the radiograph and anything else. But, you know, when you can't reach TLC, but you can't empty, both which are strength-involving, then you want to do a, a respiratory muscle strength test. Yeah. But reduced volumes, reduced DLCO, is actually PFT interpretation is pretty straightforward. You have decreased TLC and a decreased DLCO, you have restrictive parenchymal lung disease. You might have other things, but you have restrictive parenchymal lung disease. So the desaturation is cons very concerning. Right. So at this point, I had gotten into a pulmonologist, and we were sort of working up in conjunction. And we got a variety of lab tests, which I'll put up here. Um, and uh, I did, I, I think I sent the alpha-1 antitrypsin. Unfortunately, I, you know, I don't send genetic tests, but... That's okay. You know, 183 I, is pretty... Uh, you know. Know. Yeah. But it is interesting. Looking, I look back at our lab, and they call normal anything from like 90 to 130, I think. So they called this, or to 150, they called him high. Uh, although, definitely, you, you know. So anyway, um, the prominent things were sort of a marked uh, uh, lymphopenia, uh, 0.28. Um, very low CD4, CD8 count, and whether or not that proves to be relevant, I don't know, but it was very interesting, and I was certainly thinking about some sort of immune deficiency. Was he still on prednisone? Uh, he was on prednisone at this point, yeah, 20. Um, uh, sort of a mildly low IgG, but the rest of his uh, uh, humoral immunity seemed normal. Of course, he had the negative HIV. Mildly elevated LDH, that all together sort of made me think about pneumocystis, and we definitely went looking pretty hard for that for uh, going to biopsy, and I actually tried empirically treating him, which didn't help. Um, ruled out ABPA, uh, which was certainly high on the differential. That was sort of the first thing we did at the clinic, I think. He had no other signs of a systemic autoimmune process, so, uh, but we nevertheless did that whole workup. And then, and that's sort of it. So at this point, I was definitely thinking down the idiopathic sort of road, either one of the idiopathic interstitial things or something like sarcoid. Um, pulmonary took him and did a uh, transbronchial biopsy, and you may want to comment on this. It turned out to basically be non-diagnostic, right. which is what I've usually seen happening in these cases. Right. So I, you know, I, I do a lot of bronchoscopy and a lot of biopsies. When interstitial lung disease is high on your differential, which it clearly was through this workup, the the, the role of the transbronchial biopsy becomes extremely limited. Yeah. Basically, it's useful if you think there's sarcoid. If sarcoid was really high in the thought process, that would be a useful test to do because um, it can pretty effectively rule it out. But all the other things, you might get lucky. You know, organizing pneumonia is pretty high in my thought process for this guy, as well as a hypersensitivity pneumonitis um, or even a silicosis because um, none of which you're going to pick up on the, the tiny little pieces. And so if you're getting towards needing tissue, 
it's worth. I always said, you know, this is a biopsy of the wallet. Well, it is, you know, interestingly, um, myself and pulmonary, maybe, you know, I had certainly thought about sarcoid with this because I know sure. you can see that. And you can well, see no, but upper lobe predominant, and yeah, of course, sarcoid, sarcoid patients frequently have a lot of obstruction. Yeah. You know, it, it's a, it's um, very frequently the, you know, the, the Weezer that everyone's labeling asthma, 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 sarcoid. Yeah. You know, we had basically that same differential. Either something like really so it wasn't, a, it wasn't an unreasonable test, but nothing's been ruled out because of that. Um, we then got um, the thoracic surgeons involved and got a proper biopsy. And yeah. uh, indeed, that's pretty much what we found, non-caseating, uh, also calcified granulomas. And based on that and sort of his imaging, and I, I forget um, sort of how sarcoid is classified, but we felt that he certainly had sarcoid and they've staged him as uh, stage four. Yeah. Sarcoid and well, and there was definitely signs of that when you showed the CT with the upper lobe yeah. dominant, some of the fibrotic changes, but also um, I think equally important there was a lot of calcified lymphadenopathy throughout it, which can obviously be old granulomatous infection, but also is seen in long-standing underlying sarcoidosis. Right. So you have no extra thoracic uh, signs of sarcoid. No, certainly nothing that that I saw, um, and uh, so yeah. Um, interestingly, though, they didn't actually see the, the odd sort of immunophenotyping in the lung, which you'll often see sort of the inverted CD4, CD8 ratio right. and that uh, and normal, normal cell lung flow there. Anyway, that's where he is, and we're sort of deciding what to do with him. And we, there's been talk of heart-lung transplant, but I thought it was an interesting presentation. Uh, I'd be curious to get your thoughts on, on the case at all. So the, by having this much fibrosis and to be called stage four, the staging of sarcoid, the problem with it was it was a radiographic description, and it, the, stage one didn't become stage two, didn't become, you know, um, but the where he's really in a lot of trouble is the fact that this degree of fibrosis um, represents, unfortunately, too much damage done, and sarcoid patients do the worst with lung transplant. In fact, to the point where most centers actually won't even transplant him anymore. Why? Um, they, um, they get a lot of rejection for reasons that are not understood. Um, they have a lot of um, uh, higher risks, it looks like, for pulmonary hypertension. Um, and so um, a lot of them do end up needing heart lung, which almost nobody wants to do um, from just a resources perspective. Um, and the, you know, what's going to also, I think, play a major role in this guy's workup, the, especially with lungs, you know, for... All the other organs that are transplanted, lungs get done the least, and um, so they're very selective. And his social situation is going to ax him right away. He's got little to no support network. He lives in the basement of a smoky, dust-filled, cat-filled, whatever house. I mean, it's like X, X, X. You know, he's going to—they're not going to give him lungs, and it's, it's really—it's a shame. But it's limited resource, so they're going to give him to somebody that's going to have, you know, clear, obvious support, support, support socially. Stable home environment, clean home environment. He's in a minimum. We're gonna have to quit smoking for six months, or we're able to touch him, you know. And so um, it all all factors in there. You know, the problem too is is it's always still considered a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, sarcoid, you know, um, non casein granulomas. If they're uh, depends on whether they were really tight perivascular or whether they are sort of more loose and parenchymal, are seen in hypersensitivity pneumonitis. You see non-caseating granulomas even in old infections. Now, I, I think the guy's got sarcoid, but it's always important for us to remember this is a diagnosis of exclusion. And he's clearly got a lot of occupational exposures that have potentially done this to him. Right. And I know they stain for uh, a variety of other stuff. Yeah. It, but it's, it's a good point. I mean, as far as extra, heart, extra pulmonary manifestations, um, the, the, what's becoming more and more appreciated is the roughly five up to ten percent of people that actually have cardiac involvement? You'll see it on MRI, um, and it's actually an indication for an AICD because of the risk for sudden cardiac death. Um, otherwise, if you actually biopsy a lot of their livers, you'll find it. But who cares? It actually has almost no clinical manifestations in the liver, so you don't, it's a it's an autopsy based finding. You know? One question I have putting this together: Do you think this had probably been? I, I don't really know the natural history of progression of sarcoid. Has it probably been brewing for years, if not, you know? Yeah. Most, almost definitely. If it's sarcoid, it's almost definitely that. Yeah. It would be one of those interesting things to see if we could ever find or unearth an old film, yeah. you know, from all his adventures at Doc in a Box. Does he ever remember getting an X-ray? Yeah. 
um, ever that we can dig up. And if it shows some of the similar findings, then it even gives you a better understanding. You know, if you had one a year ago and it was actually looked normal, it won't. I, you know, but it, you know, SARCO doesn't do that, so it would, it would reopen the hunt for something more broadly. So what do you have to offer him for treatment? Very little. I mean, immune immune regulation through you know <coughs> steroids and methotrexate and things yeah, like that. That's what we put him on. It's yeah. Like the methotrexate. Uh -huh. it, it might. It might. It might uh, I mean, it's in your things. I've seen I've seen a variety of different cases of sarcoid, and some of them will just you can put them on steroids for a while. They go into remission and they do great. Right. Um, some of them. A group that has this much fibrosis are typically doesn't. What about the malaria for malignancy? Um, the, with those drugs, or just it, it, because of this, um, there's not an associated increased risk of malignancy with sarcoid. There is for like the dermatomyositis and associated, you know, collagenovascular ILDs. Um, the the biggest thing that happens to these folks is because of the amount of parenchymal damage, they start they do become at risk for um, secondary infections, you know, fungal infections, fungal balls, and then you know we go and immune suppress them as well. Um, you know, and so these guys pick up aspergillus, they pick up pseudomonas, they pick up mycobacterium avium because they've got some structure. I mean, he had a lot of bronchiectasis on those limited cuts you had there too. So I, I've had him on Bactrim and uh, azithromycin prophylaxis yeah. because of that and because he had zero CD4 yeah. cells. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, you know, I don't know if he needs them, but and his prednisone therapy. It's a tough case because he's probably had this for a while. The problem too is with the natural history, the best we understand of sarcoid. Probably no matter what we did all along the way, even if the correct diagnosis had been made however many years ago, this is unfortunately still where he'd likely end up. It was a shame. Why is he so lymphopenic? Because you don't see that classically with sarcoid. Yeah, well, you can. You can. I, I put it on my differential for CD4 lymphopenia, certainly. Uh, it's, well, it's described. It's not classic. It could also be a relative effect of how much steroid yeah. you might be on. I mean, these aren't percentages, these are absolute numbers. Absolute numbers. So the absolute CD4 is 19. And CD8 of 6. Of 6. Yeah. You want to reset the HIV test? Yeah, I sent it twice. Yeah, I okay. think, uh, and I think I actually sent an HIV PCR um, as well, and it was negative. So. Interesting. But, uh, mm -hmm. I, so there can I, be, there can be, if it, oh, the rest of all is cell lines normal, because sarcoid can affect the bone marrow too. Yeah. yeah. Um, his new, yeah, the red, he's got a normal, he's not. So this is an isolated? It's isolated lymphopenia. Okay. Which, and, and that, yeah, was interesting. And like I said, I, I thought with this, he may have some sort of immune issue and have PCP, and I treated him for a month with Bactrim just because, I guess, this guy would come in so infrequently. Any clinical improvement on his uh, steroids and methotrexate? He, he does well on the steroids. I mean, he, he definitely, at 20 milligrams of prednisone, seems to be stable. Any objective? I mean, does his FEV1 go up at all? But, uh, I think, I mean, I, I, I honestly don't think we've tried taking him off of it or tapering uh, much. I, from his history, it seemed that he would exacerbate when right, he right, right. off of steroids. No, but I'd be curious, other than feeling it, are you getting any, you know, I saw a lot of fibrosis. I didn't see a lot of ground glass. I didn't see a lot of yeah. things that, you know, that at least imply that there's acute inflammation still. I don't think I've seen any re real change in his FEV1. Okay. Um, and he's been on my Was his echo normal? No, he actually has, I think I... Snuck it in there somewhere. Pulmonary hypertension. I think I went. I may have left it off, but he had right-sided. He had pulmonary hypertension that was probably underread. He had a PASP of 33, but he also had decreased RV function. Uh, so he, he has, and that's why they're talking about cardiac and uh, right. you know long cardiac transplant. No, I mean I, I hope they'll transplant him, but I'm pessimistic. Yeah. You know, he right now he's not interested. We sort of broached or yeah. pulmonary broached that discussion. Yeah. How old is this guy again? 40. Yeah. Um, so he's taking it all <laughs> in stride. Right? But you're right. I mean, the, the key finding, like you said, was the X-ray. I mean, this is not obviously an ever an X-ray of an asthmatic, and the volume right. loss is what's scary. Yeah. So, this is a question for someone now far removed from general medicine. <clears throat> Should he have oxygen? Yes. Does oxygen yeah. <clears throat> change the? Just make you feel better, or does it change the course of your disease? It doesn't change the course of your disease of sarcoid, but it is, it's an extrapolation of you know, the, the, the COPD data that shows increased, morta or increased mortality if you're hypoxemic. But there's also the fact that he's got some pulmonary hypertension, and, if, and you get the hypoxic vasoconstriction. So at a minimum, he needs to be on oxygen just to prevent the hypoxic vasoconstriction that will aggravate his pulmonary hypertension. 
And it will be one of those surrogate markers for transplant. You arrive to clinic every time without wearing your oxygen and turning blue, we're not going to give you lungs. Because if you can't wear your oxygen, you're not going to take the meds either. You're not going to show up for your Bronx. You're not going to, you know, and we got 30 other people waiting for lungs who will follow the rules. I will actually say he, he's pretty compliant. Good. He actually has stopped smoking, at least he reports it. He's still in that home environment, and he does wear his oxygen you know, all Good. the time. Good. So we'll see. Right now, he's Good. sort of scared by the whole you know, transplant idea. You bet. And he didn't have any other infections in the city, the very low. I, I mean, we, we did multiple sputums. They stained off the biopsy. You know, I, I, I didn't believe he didn't have PCP until they stained the biopsy. Um, but yeah, we haven't found anything. And, you know, it goes to speak that idiopathic CD4 lymphopenia, those people may not be at actual risk, you know, goes to show that HIV is really functional. And also low CD19, 35 is also low. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm surprised he's not been more infected, but right. um, he, that doesn't seem to be a significant component. Interesting. So, anyway. So the thing is, too, even if it's not sarcoidic, it's like chronic hypersensitivity, pneumonitis, um, it still represents damage done. I mean, the problem where he's at now with the degree of fibrotic damage that he has is it almost is more of an academic discussion of how he got here because he's here, yeah. unfortunately. So my goal was to you know present an interesting case and make us always step back, think about, I mean, the case we had the other week, you know, or that David had done, always thinking about what are the other possibilities expanding the differential and sort of how I think through these diseases. Absolutely. Nice job.